my view is that the essential problem with COVID or a lot of other things, it's an infection control, prevention and management problem. I mean, there's all these other issues that are important, obviously, very important, like vaccination and, and other things. But that's where my interest is, is how you decrease the spread and minimise the impact of this. And I might say this is all shades of grey. People try and make it black and white, but it's shades of grey and it changes as time goes on. The situation now is different to two years ago, including how the virus, I think, behaves as well, or the variants we've got now. So I'll, I'll try and put... Um, um, this will end up being controversial, I guess, because I think we don't always have the answers and people are dogmatic about it. But I'll try and, I think, only speak for about 40 minutes, so we have a good 20 minutes for questions. Um, and uh, I think it's really valuable if people ask questions, um, disagree, however you want to put it, because that actually is how you go forward in this and, you know, how do we do better in the future? I mean, um, this pandemic is bad. This is a virus that's not good. But to put in perspective, 1918 uh, Spanish flu was much worse than this uh, when you look at the figures, and we need to take that into account too. And there's a balance between what you do to prevent infections and the collateral damage, be it on education, economies, which then do cause their own lots of problems, including death. So that's all got to be taken into account. And to some degree, I think a lot of that has not necessarily. But anyway, we'll go on. Um, I put this up because literally two days ago, uh, in one of the Lancet um, associated uh, article um, things, a group of us um, ask what could we have done better in Australia, or what we did well, what we could have done better. So if you like, a whole lot of my um, lecture, if anybody wants to read it, is in this Lancet article that came out a couple of days ago with a number of, I think, very, um, I thought, impressive colleagues, including Tanya Sorrell, Catherine Bennett, um, Bart Curry, Peter, you know, there, there's quite a lot of, I respect their opinion. We don't always have the same views, I might say. And so when you do these joint papers, um, there's necessarily compromises in words, but I wouldn't have put my name on it if I didn't agree with the overall principles. So um, I thought that was very important um, and it really summarises, I think, a lot of things I was going to say. Now, basically, I still think this is essentially an infection prevention and control problem, and that's what's paramount. And my overall view during this epidemic is not all the right experts were given the advice at the highest levels. Uh, there was a lot of anaesthetists and intensive care people that got a lot of advice and their contribution to infection control, in my view, over the last decades has been pretty minimal. So, you know, there's been a lot of people who've, I think, had, uh, you know, appropriate, um, you know, giving, uh, you know, input. But, um, you know, I think the people in hospitals who know more about infection control and prevention are infection control prevention practitioners who are mainly nurses. And even in the hospital, they weren't at the highest level of advice, yet alone in, the, in, in broader things. So I think a lot of times the people who've got the practical knowledge didn't percolate up to the area uh, as they should. And that was both for the hospital and the community. And I think to a large degree, fear and politics overcame necessarily the most appropriate decisions or clouded it. And you could see the arguments about how New South Wales was doing it versus Victoria and New Zealand, for instance. Now, I'd argue New South Wales did as well, if not better, than Victoria with less stringent restrictions and had a better end result. But we we'll, can look at the data to see whether that's true or not <laughs> later. And I think there is still poor data on basic infection control issues. How much difference does wearing a mask really make? Is there any difference between a respirator N95 mask and a, and a surgical mask, for instance? They're basic questions that, and, you know, that are still unanswered. Um, and, and there's also things about new drugs, the vaccines, um, because we are still not doing, in my view, the science properly, because people think, oh, it's unethical. But if you don't do some basic research, particularly in lower risk groups, like you know, people in their 20s, you can never answer the fundamental questions that have got a lot of issues and a lot of costs for what we do in the future. Um, COVID's not going to go away. It's going to be here, well, at least for decades. So every winter, in my view, we're going to have a problem. But how do we learn to minimise the risk with, the, if you like, the maximum benefit for the least amount of collateral damage? Um, I put this up is 
there's a lot of perception that governments control all this, you know, and the government's got to have rules. Um, from my perception, when you look at the first epidemic curve in Australia, where we had lockdowns over all states, numbers were coming down before any um, restrictions were put in place. The curve had already changed a bit. And you've got to remember, any restriction you put in place takes seven days to have an effect. Now, this is data that, you know, I found in a paper from the US and um, apparently Ohio has almost no restrictions and Illinois has a lot. And what this actually showed, it's people's behaviour that changes that makes the difference rather than government regulations. I mean, my own view is government rules don't work unless 90% of the population believe they're a good idea. And, and I think that's an issue for the currently too and why there's been a big change. But this actually shows irrespective of the government regulations, you had people complying and doing things that decreased the rate of transmission. Okay? Um, it, so that, that's all that says. Um, another controversial thing, I'll get on to another subject, is where did this virus come from? Um, well, it came from bats, okay? <laughs> um, and how did it get to bats of people? I think the short answer is we don't know. The common theory at the moment is it came from bats to people probably at the Wuhan seafood market that also sold animals. However, there were cases before that market. There was no doubt that was a super spreading event. And I don't think we can discount the fact that it came out of the lab because they were collecting huge numbers of viruses. And what really worried me was they were culturing them in human and monkey cells. Now, with any animal virus, if you want it to get into people and spread, You've got to adapt it for a new host. Well, in my mind, well, you can put it in animals that are, you know, been genetically engineered to be more human-like, but if you're growing a virus in a cell line that's human, well, that strikes me as a good way of suddenly allowing a virus to get to people and spread to people. Now, you know, I don't think we'll ever probably know the answer, but I think there's a bit of a conflict of interest in all the people say, oh, no, it couldn't possibly come from the lab, their procedures are so good. Well, first of all, smallpox probably, H1N1 came out of a Russian lab. Smallpox is, you know, um, leaked out of a lab in, in the UK. There's been lots of leaks from high security labs, um, including SARS from labs in Taiwan. So I don't think anybody can dogmatically say it didn't come. Equally, you can't say it did. Um, and But my own view is that because grants and everything are so dependent for these labs, there is a lot of conflict of interest with people, if you like, wanting grants to continue. For in my mind, where is the evidence that it's actually improved vaccines or improved drugs for all what I think is a risky procedure? Now, that's controversial, okay, but um, I think it is an issue. Um, so, um, and this is an issue in the future about what else we do um, in, in these things. So there were a lot of things that were done. I might say with um, funding from the US government because they weren't allowed to do it in the US so they, NIH funded a group that then did the research in, the, um, in uh, Wuhan because they were worried about influenza and there was some gain of functions done and there was a moratorium put over a number of presidents in the US so they couldn't do this research in the US, so indirectly they funded the research to be done in China. That doesn't mean that was a cause, I might say, but it, it, it is interesting how internationally it goes. So, you know, where do, what animals we put viruses into? You know, if you modify mice to be suddenly human, you know, adapted, it strikes me. The, the fundamental problem I find with any of these viruses, because most bad viruses we've had, including measles, measles, probably came from cattle when we first started herding cattle and then humans adapt and HIV is another example. Just about every virus you can think of originally was in animals, then became human adapted and spread from human to human. So I think we've got to be careful we don't give these viruses an extra start that they wouldn't have had, if you like, in the natural environment. Um, you know, and that's the cell lines. What levels of protection do you have for staff? Uh, you know, the wet markets are an issue, I think, because you have a lot of animals stressed in close contact with people. And the whole human and animal interface, um, if you look at Lyme disease in the US and elsewhere, it's because a lot of um, changes in vegetation, so deers with tick were closer to people and therefore you got the bacteria thing. So there's lots of these factors that increase our risk, plus just hu increasing human population. Now, one of the really controversial about um, COVID was children. 
Now, having quite a number of grandchildren myself, I can tell you, if you want to get an infection, just have grandchildren. They're really good at doing it. And for most respiratory viruses, children would have four or five times more infection than do adults. But I actually think the evidence for children is that they're not the super spreaders. Uh, yes, they can get it, they can spread it. But not the same as influenza or, you know, adenovirus and a whole lot of others. But because of that, we had quite prolonged school closures. In some places like the Philippines, schools have been closed for two years. You know, the, the, the poorer the country, the longer um, the schools were closed. In, in Australia and Victoria in particular, but even there was a lot of school closures here. Uh, the whole mask for young people, the masks, you know, um, how much difference does masking young children have? And, and in fact, there's a danger in children under the age of five, for instance, wearing masks with choking and stuff. So they, in my view, they were not super spreaders. Their parents had a bigger risk of spreading it than children and the teachers. And most of the school outbreaks were, in fact, in staff schoolrooms or functions for adults. Now, that doesn't mean children don't spread it. They do. But they do it less than their parents. Um, Vaccine policies, again, um, I'll bring this up. The worst age to be is probably in our age group, you know, over the age of 70. We definitely get worse outcomes if we get infected. The ones with the lowest risk are actually children. So they are actually at the lowest risk, but often had most of the imp you know, impositions put on them, they and young adults. Um, and there's a lot of collateral damage from restrictions, economically, schooling. You know, some, people, some children have lost two years of schooling and you can't see how that's going to be fixed up. And the worse you are off socioeconomically, the worse you did. I mean, I've heard of examples in northern New South Wales. Well, I'll give you my ex example. Um, um, one of my daughters has four children. They lived in Brisbane and they had homeschooling. They had enough money to buy a computer for every one of those children and they had good internet. And it was still a big thing. Other people I've heard in northern New South Wales, they just didn't do anything for six months. So this is very socioeconomic dependent of the poor outcomes from restrictions. And, and even if you look at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, statistics, if you came from a poorer English second language, you had five times the death rate of COVID than if you were, you know, basically more like I presume most of the people are in this room. So there is a real difference in socioeconomic outcome where the people who have um, the least downside in forms of re effectively restrictions but also pay and loss of income are the people who are at lower risk of having a bad outcome. You know, if, if you're a family of six in a two bedroom apartment well, you can't go out in the backyard very often and do all those things. So there's a lot of social issues to do with what we've done as well. This is in Australia, and I think this data is from a few months ago, I can't remember, but this basically shows you the group uh, of diagnosed uh, COVID cases. Now, you can make, a lot of the arguments are oh, children had it and we never know it, but there were serological studies, particularly UK did a lot of good studies. And essentially what this shows is essentially what most countries show whichever way they look at it. The peak group for infections were 20 to 40 year olds. Um, males, well, and it varied a bit actually. Um, I think uh, males had worse outcomes, but females had slightly more infections. And children had lower rates of infection than their parents. Now this is, uh, and you can see the older age groups had much lower rates of infection. And that's because they were taking more precautions, quite appropriately, because they were more at risk, OK? I'm not, and what's happened more in the last six months is the infection, for the first time, has got to a lot, a lot of the people in more our age group. And that's why, you know, we're seeing increased deaths as well. But this is the death rate in Australia. So down below the age of 40, very few deaths, even though that's where most infections are occurring. It's, really those over the age of 80 that have the highest death rate. And if you look at this as another way, this is um, from about um, two years ago, and it's important data because it's before vaccines were available. Basically, if you're a 30-year-old and got COVID, you're unvaccinated, your chance of dying was about one in 10,000. Now, I might say people say, oh, well, what do you worry about that? Well, if you've got a million people, that's suddenly 100 deaths, I might say, so in people that wouldn't have otherwise died. But if you're an 80-year-old, you had at least a 10% chance of dying or higher. 
So a huge differential. And if you look at the, the Spanish flu from 1918, the biggest group that died then were 20 to 30 year olds. Uh, and they had about a 2% a case fatality rate. Um, so um, that, on a society point of view, had a much bigger impact um, because the overall mortality rate was higher and it was in a group of people who, you know, basically were out there working and, and a lot of people depended on them. Um, so, you know, th there is a huge effect on age, on your mortality chance. Now, this is a paper from a bunch of economists, I think. You, uh, the reason I looked at it is because they have a different way of looking at this. And this talks about, again, the mortality rate, but it talks about the inter intergenerational trade-off, and I think this is an issue. The people who get the most benefits from restrictions are people over the age of 60, because we have the biggest chance of dying. But we don't necessarily pay the biggest economic costs and social costs. It's the younger people who are much less of a risk. And you can't see all the fine print here, but basically, the richer you are as a country, the more you probably saw your mortality rate go down with lockdowns. In other words, if you're high off as a country, you, you probably saw a reduction on their modelling of the number of people you saw. But if you go into, um, but interesting, the top, um, I'm not sure if I can, does that show up there? The, the top left-hand corner here is poorer countries, and they see much less benefit from the lockdowns. And particularly if you start looking at this based on age, in some places, you actually increase deaths in children by having lockdowns because they had a very low risk of dying of COVID because their risk was so low, but they can't get basic um, facilities delivered to them. Immunisation, et cetera, has gone down markedly around the world, not for COVID, but for all the other diseases. So all of those catch up or your water supply is not as good. So if you're in a low socioeconomic country, you seem to have a lot more downsides to children in particular than the benefits you got from decreasing their risk of COVID death, which was pretty low. Uh, and that even takes into account if their parents may or may not have died, because the parents are often younger and had a low risk. Um, this is just, an, again, there's numerous places you can say, and, and I, I, I think I've been trying to look at all the data objectively rather than cherry picking, but UNICEF and other people have come down as a huge loss of learning to children that will never be made up from COVID restrictions and lockdowns and school closures. Now, you, and to some degree, that's this intergenerational trade-off. The biggest losers were often children who had the lowest individual risk. Now, that may be worthwhile keeping their parents alive or their grandparents alive, but you know, we need to be a bit more, I think, conscious of the fact that that has occurred. Now, how did Australia do? I think Australia did very well. As much as a lot of people are saying we didn't, I think we've done very well for a number of reasons. And one of them was that we closed our borders to a lot of people coming in. I personally think the bushfires were an advantage too, because you might remember in January, there was all this argument that you know Australia looked like it was on fire, because we did have a lot of fires, I might say. So I think we had a lot less tourists coming in, which meant the virus was already circulating at least in December in France and obviously in China. And in January, I think it was widely circulating in the US and Europe, but was not recognised yet. So we had a lot of people, if you like, less people coming than normal. But equally, we put restrictions in place for at least the high prevalence places initially. And then um, we had uh, all restrictions and quarantine. Now, I actually think that made a difference to the number of people coming in and spreading it. Um, so I, I do believe that was a good policy move and it was good to do it early. Quarantine, hotel quarantine, people say, oh, that was appalling, but you might actually think the, there was a number that went out, um, um, particularly in Victoria, and that caused a big problem in 2020. But again, I actually think it was an infection control uh, issue. They the people who were manning those hotels were not given any infection control training whatsoever in, in Victoria, as far as I can see. Um, you, know, you know, in retrospect, I think that was a big mistake. Um, New South Wales, I was part of a federal government review looking at the quarantine arrangements in, in 2020, and I went to a number of these places. New South Wales, in my view, was doing it very well. They had very good um, surgical mask eye protection, which I think is really neglected. Anything that 
can go into your nose. If it drops into your eye, it goes straight to your nose. So eye protection, I think we've still really underappreciated. But they actually looked after, in their quarantine hotels in 2020, 700 return travellers who were positive because they put them all under, under central health uh, area. They did not have one transmission to any staff member. So I think they were doing it very well. And you can say, well, New South Wales was the cause of the Delta outbreak. Well, that probably, well, you can say who you can blame. I think it would have happened eventually anyway. But that was a return cargo air crew. It wasn't a quarantine hotel and a, and a driver in a car. Cars are dangerous places for recirculating air, I might say. So, um, you know, I think hotel quarantine decreased the risk by about 99%. It wasn't a zero risk, but that's the order it decreased the risk than if you didn't do it, okay? I think it was that order. So it wasn't zero risk, but it markedly decreased the risk. And so I think a lot of things we did do, we did do very well. And I think a lot of the contact tracing and testing was very good. One of the things that um, we don't still do as well as we should is sewage testing. Um, if you really want to know what's going on in society, test the sewage, because whether people front up or not, have got symptoms or not, or want to hide it, they still go to the toilet and it comes out the other end where you can measure it and you can see what new variants. And also, it tends to predate by about four or five days before your clinical cases and about 10 days before your hospital admissions. And New South Wales has stopped doing it as far as, you know, I actually think that's the one public health monitoring that's going to be more useful than anything else, mind you. I have a bit of conflict of interest because I did do a, um, a study with NCEF on this and we showed you could pick up one person in 100,000 with the virus by looking at, at faeces. So it was very sensitive as well. It's also very good for antimicrobial resistance monitoring for anybody who's interested. So what about vaccines? Well, vaccines are the life saviour of all of this as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's a lot of controversy. You might remember in 2020, um, the federal government was backing a Queensland University vaccine that was very good, except for some reason they used a HIV protein to, you know, stabilise it or something, and all these people had HIV antibodies, which is a problem, um, you know, for the rest of your life. Um, and then we ended up having the um, AstraZeneca vaccine, mainly because of the deal CSL did with, you know, AstraZeneca. Um, and at that stage, and still now, I might say, we have no ability still to make messenger RNA vaccines, and they were pretty new. And there were a number of others, the Novavax one, which was a more traditional one, but was still by genetically engineered moth cells, I think it came out of. Um, so some of the vaccines, um, or most of the ones we use in Australia, gave you a template, be it DNA or RNA, where you made the spike protein in your own lymph node or your muscle. While the more traditional vaccines like Novavax and the Queen was presenting you an already made spike protein, which coats the virus. Now, at the end of the day, all those vaccines were very good at eliciting an immune response, and um, they became available at the end, you know, December 2020, actually, but it, to some degree. But they were all very good. And to put it in perspective, they all decreased your risk of death by over 90%. Now, an influenza vaccine gives you about a 50% reduction. So these were good vaccines, but they had side effects, like every drug and every vaccine we have. I mean there was this expectation you would have zero risk. Well, that was never realistic. And the AstraZeneca vaccine got trashed because of this clotting thing. Now, that was a real risk, and it was a more of a risk if you were younger, and particularly if you were a woman. But your overall risk on a population basis of dying from that complication was one in a million. Versus if you're a 70-year-old, okay, one in 20, one in 50 of dying if you got COVID, yeah, there was a risk, but the benefits so far outweighed it. The real problem was, when you were successful in controlling it, everybody said, oh, wait a minute, you know, we, we, we're never going to have spread here, so we don't need it. So in my view, at least in, in 2021, um, when it became available, we had a lot of extra deaths, particularly in Victoria, because a lot of my colleagues were bad-mouthing the AstraZeneca vaccine, so people didn't take it up. I know my own... Um, mother-in-law who was in her 90s, she was given pressure from, you know, one of her um, siblings or one of her children, oh, wait, to, wait for Pfizer, it's so much better. And, you know, God, you know, eventually I talked her into getting it. But it was, you know, that was a real effort. Um, and it markedly decreased your risk of dying. 
So I think a lot of my colleagues, uh, and was Pfizer a better vaccine? Well, it did seem at the stage it decreased transmission a bit more, but at the end of the day, they're about the same for their efficacy in decreasing death and hospitalisation. So, you know, we had a lot of people, I think a few hundred people died in Australia needlessly because of that adverse media publicity that basically underrated that vaccine. And the other advantage, I might say, that vaccine you could store at four degrees. The Pfizer one had to be at minus 70. And the Moderna at minus 20. Now, they've fixed that. But that's not practical for most of the world. Plus it was, instead of $4 a dose, it was $25 or $50 a dose. You know, money and practicalities are important. And having a zero risk mentality didn't help us, in my view, and didn't help the world. Uh, particularly since probably 80% of poorer people are still not vaccinated. You might say, well, they missed the boat because most of them have been natural infection now. But, you know, there was a lot of controversy about vaccines that was needless, um, wanting a perfect product with no side effects, which is an impossibility for any medical drug or vaccine. Uh, and I think the benefits so outweighed the downsides that it was problematic. Um, um, the other thing is, we did do it, in my view, in Australia appropriately, in that we had a sequence of people who could get the vaccine. I was one of the first people to get the vaccine because I worked at the hospital, I guess. But we prioritised people in nursing homes and then people over the age of 70. That was entirely appropriate. And if you want to see what happens when you don't do that properly, look at Hong Kong. They had zero COVID, just like we did. Then it got in and they had huge numbers of people dying, mainly the elderly, because they had not enough of them vaccinated and probably not with a vaccine, but there was a, a large proportion of their elderly unvaccinated. So they went from having one of the low, I'll show a graph later, lowest death rates in the world to one of the you know, middle of the road where they shouldn't have got there. Um, I'm not sure I, you know, this is just the current fatality rates in Australia. And basically you can see, if, if you look at the bottom here, um, most of the deaths occur in people over the age of 60, particularly over the age, and the vaccines really do markedly drop your, um, your, your um, you know, your, your um, case fatality rate. You know, if you look at here, 1.4% to 0.3%. Now, so, you know, I, I, I expect to be tenfold. In fact, these figures don't look as good as I expect because all the studies you see still talk about a 90% decrease in death even, you know, six months, 12 months after you've been vaccinated, providing if you're older, you get at least one booster. So um, vaccines do make a difference, in my view. This is from The Economist, and what I think this shows nicely again is basically this was your mortality rate which goes up at age. You know, I would have thought it's slightly higher than this, but it doesn't matter. But if you get vaccinated as an 80-year-old, you drop your mortality rate to here which makes you the equivalent of a 50-year-old who's unvaccinated. So there's this expectation that we get vaccinated and you'll have no deaths. That's unrealistic. What it does, it makes you 30 years younger, but it doesn't make you into a 5-year-old or 10-year-old, OK? <laughs> so, um, and, and I don't think we actually have this appreciation of benefit versus risks. You know, we're into black and white. I'll have absolute protection. And this is all relative risk um, reduction which I might say vaccines do very well. And this is another slide from The um, Economist, which I think is also useful. When this first started, people, some people were saying, oh, it's just like flu. It was never just like flu, because it had at least a 20 times higher mortality than influenza. But with variations in the variants and vaccination, its mortality rate now is about the same as influenza. The only difference is we only have one influenza wave a year and in Australia, we've had at least four waves in the last eight months. And that's why we've got 10,000 people dying instead of 3,000 people dying, because we've had four or five waves. But my expectation is, and, and I'll put this in print and think in the Australian Financial Review, um, is that we'll end up with just one big wave a year, mainly in winter. But, and you'll have, you know, the rest of the time you'll have cases, but at a much lower level. What about lockdowns? Well, lockdowns or restrictions work to decrease infections. And you need restrictions until you have your population vaccinated, particularly your elderly, but preferably everybody. So they do have a benefit. You know, we actually had little spread in Australia 
because of restrictions. Um, how severe your lockdowns need to be is a separate argument. And um, I guess um, they were never part of any pandemic plan. Lockdowns like China used it in Wuhan and it appeared to be effective. And that actually influenced policy changes. The only country that probably kept to a pandemic plan was actually, um, well, Sweden gets a reputation, but in fact, Japan and South Korea probably never locked down either. They had partial restrictions, but so not every country in the world had lockdowns, but um, China did. And then New Zealand was probably the main Western country that adopted that policy. And it was quickly adopted by Victoria. And that was a lot of the politics. Um, you might remember, you know, New South Wales isn't locking down soon enough. Uh, look, you know, do what they're doing in Victoria and New Zealand. Well, at the end, it hasn't made a lot of difference for the number of excess deaths and cumulative deaths. In fact, Victoria's had more deaths per population than New South Wales on an age-adjusted thing. There's not in it, a lot in it, I might say, but I think that is one of the views that it's a problem. And once it became more infectious, these restrictions were less effective for probably two reasons, because it was easier to transmit the virus, but also people tire of it. You can have these restrictions maybe for a year, um, but to do it for two, three, and what some people want ongoing, I just don't think that's realistic, that you'll get the cooperation to, to achieve that as well. That's not to say people shouldn't take individual protection themselves. I still, if I go to a restaurant, eat outside rather than inside, okay? So I think there's a lot of things you can do to decrease your own risk, but you can't make your risk zero. Um, and, that, and that's this trade-off we have to worry about. Um, China is still trying to get zero COVID. Um, I can't actually see how they're going to succeed over this upcoming winter. I, uh, you know, the politics might change as well, but I can't see how they're not going to actually have spread within their, their community. And there, one of the problems is I think they've dropped the ball on vaccination of their elderly, OK? It, the, Hong Kong is just an example, and I suspect that'll be similar. Um, and, and even Taiwan was a bit of an example of that. That was another very well-controlled place that actually, when it got in, disproportionately some elderly were died more often than they should because people assume, oh, look, I'm safe, it'll, you know, won't be a problem, and they don't get vaccinated when they should have. Um, so... Um, now, how effective were restrictions? Well, again, it depends how you look at this. Um, Sweden was compared to other countries. Sweden has got the same mortality rate as Germany, despite never having lockdowns. Or so. But they have got a higher mortality rate than Finland and Denmark. Okay? So it depends who you compare them to. Um, Denmark recently has been a pariah because it's taken away all restrictions and, in fact, is not recommending vaccine boosters for those under the age of 40 because of the myocarditis side effect. And I think this is a real issue, is what is good for 70-year-olds may not be good for 20-year-olds. And we tend to be too black and white about it. Um, so that's the England, Scotland had much more severe restrictions than England, but as far as I can see, hasn't overall done better. In fact, it's got slightly more cases currently. Uh, Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand was put up as the example of how to do it, and Australia was bad. Well, at the end, it's been very similar as far as I can see. China, well, I'm not sure how good the data coming out of China is. To I don't think they've got widespread um, spread, but North Korea said, hey, we're pretty good until they had 4 million cases or 20 million cases, I can't remember, a lot. And for a, a virus they couldn't identify because they didn't have testing and they had no vaccination. But interestingly, despite having about 20 million infections, they only had 70 deaths, which is, you know, we should give them credit for that or how they manipulate the figures, I suspect. But anyway. Singapore uh, has done well. It's been very similar to Australia. They actually had a lower case fatality rate than us, but that's because it was mainly in young workers in their hostels that were getting it. And because they were 20 and 30 year olds, they didn't have a high mortality rate. So Singapore and Australia have done similar. Um, Singapore probably has a more compliant population, I presume, than Australia, but I was there a few months ago and I was surprised on how people weren't, you know, doing a lot to, you know, restrict themselves, so. And Japan has done, looks like it's done very well, um, with lower excess deaths than most other countries, uh, and COVID deaths, well, sorry, COVID deaths, but they do about a tenth of the testing that Australia did, 
And if you look at their excess mortality, which I think is really important to look at, they've got th a much higher excess mortality than Australia. So I think there were a lot of deaths there from COVID that weren't recognised as COVID. So I don't actually... People are putting up Japan's the way to go. Well, uh, I'm not sure I believe the data from there either. Now, this is um, what I took yesterday, I think. The data from... I actually think the two important parameters at the end that are going to be important is what is your total cumulative death per population from COVID, but you've got to look at that with excess deaths to make sure people aren't shonking the numbers or having done a test. Now, basically, Australia is down here, and in, in some ways I think very similar to all these other countries, South Korea, Japan, and South Korea and Japan never had countrywide lockdowns, I might say. They were, you know, they had restrictions, and, but um, Singapore, uh, we're all down here. Um, Hong Kong was down here until the virus got in and spread, and then because they hadn't vaccinated enough elderly, they jumped up. Um, I don't think Australia will ever get to the level of the US. While we've got uh, a lot more deaths now in the last six months, at least it was when your population was quite highly vaccinated, because that's the protection. So you will get deaths, but you'll just never get to the level of deaths that those countries had, because they had it spreading in an unvaccinated population. So, you know, a lot of Europe is up here. Um, Sweden and Germany are here. Denmark is down here. Canada has done, seems to have done, in a Canadian data, you tend to believe. Um, so, you know, the, the world has actually separated itself into these outcomes, and excess deaths are not that dissimilar from countries where you can believe the data. Um, but this has got a lot of relevance. In what restrictions do you put in place if this happens again? Because this is, to me, the ultimate result you want. You want to have the minimum number of people dying from this. Um, and, and you've got to measure that. And hospitalisation, obviously, is an issue too. It's become more complicated because of, are you there with COVID or of COVID? Uh, so, um, but, so deaths, if providing you the data is accurate, I think is way. This is another one of um, these studies that looked at and this is some economists again, so there's probably people in the audience more experienced with this than me, but I thought it was interesting. They looked at how um, intensive your restrictions were and what was your outcome based on death. And essentially, in Europe, they found no correlation, but in the US, they found a little bit of a correlation. In other words, if you had more severe restrictions, you tended to have less deaths. But, you know, it's not... It's, you can see it's a bit of a scattergram, but that's what their statistics showed. And interestingly, they then looked at all the individual things you can do. This SIP, um, SIPO stands for stay in place, you know, in other words, lockdown, stay at, you know, thing. It actually seemed to have some benefit that was, you know, 95% confidence limits. But the biggest one had business closures, which does make sense to me. If you close pubs and clubs and places where a lot of people are intermingling, you can see that, I don't find it hard to believe that that has a beneficial effect. How long you can do that for is a separate issue. But, um, you know, there's a lot of controversy. And trying to dissect this out, there's so many confounders, it's very difficult. You know, and that's why it's all shades of grey. But um, my own view is we need to minimise the amount of deaths, but you've got to take into account the collateral damage. And you've got to look at what different places have done and try and dissect out, well, what gives you the same benefit but for less economic and social costs? Um, how does COVID spread? Uh, you'd think this wouldn't be controversial, but it is. Um, basically, it spreads through the air from per person to person. And the closer you are and the more confined your space, the bigger your risk. Um, but I actually think, and I've written a few papers about this, you, your eyes, you... I might say this is an original. Um, back in uh, 1920s, somebody was writing about this with, <laughs> with Spanish flu as well. Your eyes are in direct communication with your nose and the virus replicates in your upper respiratory tract. So if you deposit the virus in your nose, you'll get replication and then usually it then goes down your airways to your lung uh, if, you, if you do badly. So I, even spectacles, in a, in a reasonable UK study, it decreased your risk taking into account um, you know, other variables by 15%. And interestingly, contact lenses don't. They didn't decrease your risk. So it is something about stopping things getting into your eyes. And I've done a study with face shields, um, well, where we looked at all the data. That decreased your risk by 50% or more in, in medical situations. So I do think protecting your eyes from direct 
um, you know, uh, particles containing virus getting in there has an, has an effect. Um, there is much less um, going by your hands than what I thought. You can actually find viable virus, and I'm sure you can inoculate yourself, but most of the spread is people in close contact for prolonged periods of time with people who are infected. Um, and faeces, it's in faeces as well. I've already mentioned sewage testing, but again, doesn't seem to be a big factor in spread. Um, now, I'll get into a non-controversial area like aerosols and droplets. Um, why is this important? Well, basically, when you cough or sneeze, you produce a lot of particles of various sizes. Now, this whole aerosol debate, which I might say I've copped a fair bit of flack about, is, and different groups have different definitions of this. Like, um, air conditioning people talk about aerosols as being anything less than 100 microns. Well, in medicine, we tend to think about five microns because that's the particle size that can get directly into your lung. And also, surgical masks don't work as well against them. So, you know, you then need a thing. Now, the long and short of this is that if you look at all of this, uh, my, I actually believe it's mainly, not all spread, you can get this um, via aerosols or small particles. The theory of small particles aerosols they stay in the air for hours and they can travel 20 or 30 metres. Now, my view is, if this is mainly spread by aerosols, we're all screwed. There's no way you're going to avoid this because, you, you know, one person here has got it, we're all going to get it, you know, if this was 2020. That doesn't mean you can't get it that way, but I just think predominantly it's through close contacts with larger particles. And... The reason, I guess, I want to believe that is because we can do something about that. It means face shields work. It means eye protection works. It means surgical masks give you reasonable protection. They probably only give you a 15% reduction, but that's still worth having. While if it's aerosols, I, you think, well, how can you ever let people on public transport again? How can you ever have a building reopen with people all there? How can you even go to a supermarket? So. Uh, you know, I think there's huge practical implications if the aerosol theory is correct for the majority of spread. But I don't think the available evidence actually shows that. Not that it can never happen that way. Even the hotels that said, people said, oh, look, you know, these people in this room and those people got it, it's because both doors were opened at the same time and they were less than two metres apart. And the other thing is, uh, droplets don't all drop to the air within 30 seconds. If you've got the right airflow behind you, they can go four or five metres, but they tend to go in a straight line rather than this dispersion. So I think there is a lot with ventilation and stuff we've got to do better, but I, um, and I seem to be in a minority now, I might say, but um, I don't think aerosols, as defined in traditional medicine, is a big factor in the spread. It is a factor, but not a big factor. And uh, these are just some um, articles I've been involved in looking at evidence for eye transmission. Um, and mask mandates, well, I think masks are useful, OK? I don't think mandates are useful anymore because I don't think there's evidence that they work. That doesn't mean you should not tell people to wear them, but that's different for fining people for not wearing them. And look, you know, there's no good studies to really answer this question, but you see studies like this when one area has a mandate and another doesn't. And you know, and the same in Germany, they've got some, Bavaria had N95 respirators and the rest of the country had ordinary surgical masks, or mostly. And when you look at the epidemic curves on a population basis, you can't see a marked difference. Now, as far as I can see, nobody's shown me this data's been manipulated wrong, but all the figures I've seen where you look at this, you're hard pressed to show that mandates make a difference. I still believe masks are worth wearing, okay? But I think that's different from mandating and believing it has a huge effect on a population curve at this stage. Ventilation. Well, this has got a lot to do with aerosols. And I might say um, I've received a bit of flack for co-writing this article. There's a guy in England called Hobday who talks about open air factors. And I, he got in contact with me by email. I've never met him, but we've co-written a paper. And what I thought was interesting is all the research that's been done. Florence Nightingale wanted big ceilings and open air rooms because it made a lot of difference even back 150 years ago for the amount of infections you saw. And interestingly, in World War I and the Spanish flu, people who were nursed outside in tents did better than people who were nursed in, in buildings. 
um, the, the staff hated it because it was cold, but the patients didn't mind. And even for wounds, actually, you did better being outside. Now, a lot of that, I think, is dilution effects. You know, there's so much thing. But there are factors in outside air that kill viruses and bacteria, and the British in their germ warfare branch in the 60s and 70s showed that. They were worried about uh, anthrax and various things, uh, um, uh, various bacteria they were going to... And they found that if you exposed a lot... Not spores, anthrax actually doesn't get killed by outside air, but a lot of bacteria and viruses die very rapidly if exposed to air, more so day during night, but even nighttime air. And whether it's ozone or hydrogen peroxide or a whole lot of even pollutants, it's not clear, it's probably a mixture, but there's no doubt that outside air is protective uh, compared to stale inside air that's not ventilated. So I think ventilation is important, but for a different reason than is being proposed at the moment. And that has an issue about HEPA filters. I think HEPA filters are probably a good idea to get pollens out of the air, if nothing else. How much difference it makes for infection, I don't know. But they're the sort of studies you need to do. If you're going to spend billions of dollars on retrofitting buildings, I think we need some basic data to show how much benefit you get from it, and we don't have that. Um, socioeconomic, um, I've sort of touched on this. Basically, the poorer you are, the worse you do. Not a surprise. Um, but um, a lot of the impositions we have put in place have much more detrimental effect on those who are less well off on a country basis as well as internal in society. So I'm speaking too long. Um, this is what I think is going to happen um, for COVID. I think we've had our... The highest mortality is when it spreads through your community the first time. So in the US and Europe, it was actually 2020 and 2021 is where they got their highest mortality. In Australia, it was earlier this year because that's when we had probably 80% of the population in the last eight months have been infected. Um, but a much lower mortality rate because we've been immunised. But you'll get it. You can't, that's why I think China's going to have a problem. You know, when it spreads, you're going to get a problem. That's what happened in Hong Kong. But interestingly, there was only one or two years that Spanish flu was really bad, and then it went back down. But you might notice it didn't go to basal levels. There were still increased deaths for the next four or five winters. It was just markedly less than those big peaks. And I think that's what we're going to see as well. So that doesn't mean we can say, hey, this isn't a problem anymore. It is. But it's a different approach because the risk profile is different. And what's the future look like? Well, I think in Asia Pacific, we've done very well for lots of reasons. Next winter, I still think will probably be a problem. At least we'll know what happens in winter in North America, Canada and Europe will tell us what to maybe expect here. Um, and what preparation we need to do, particularly in March or April, uh, with everything from who needs boosters, do they need boosters, what drugs do we need to have available. Um, and low and middle income countries, well, they've caught, got the raw end of this all along. Um, and I think we've got to work out, particularly, how do you get vaccines to those places more efficiently and better um, in the future, because that's as well as learning from ventilation, being outside more, etc. So at that stage, I'll stop because I've gone longer than I thought I would anyway, and I'll take questions. <laughs>